Good morning, church. <clears throat> there is an uh, outline, your order of services. You might want to actually follow along. That will actually be helpful. Uh, as we look at this portion of the Bible, uh, it's the second of the last two uh, that we'll be looking at as we bring our series in 1 Thessalonians uh, to a close. Uh, let me actually pray for us. Gracious God, we do thank you that you speak in and through your word. We just want to pray right now that you might be so gracious as to help us not just understand the scriptures, but that you might bring it to bear into our lives so that we might always live uh, to please you. We do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as we come to chapter 4, chapter 5, uh, if you have a look in your Bibles, what, what's actually happening in chapter 4 and chapter 5 is Paul is giving uh, the Thessalonian church instructions on Christian living. So that's what we're going to look at these two weeks, uh, Paul's instructions on Christian living. Uh, if you can remember chapter 1, in chapter 1, Paul gave thanks <coughs> uh, to them, and he reminds them uh, that they are loved and they are chosen by God. And, and he knew that. He knew they were loved and chosen by God because of the way they responded to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Uh, he's thankful for that. And he's thankful because he's seen change in their lives. We read chapter 1, they turn from idols to serve the true and living God. Uh, their lives changed in the way they thought of the future. They lived anticipating, waiting for, longing for the, for the coming of Jesus to right all the wrongs uh, they saw and experienced in the world. And so when you come to chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul ends this letter <clears throat> with instructions on how Christian people should live. Uh, this is how they are to live pleasing God. This is how they are to live anticipating uh, the return of Jesus, which is what we'll look at next week. Now, there are two things I want to say as a preface. It's there in your sermon outline, and it's very, very important that I say these things. Before we look at verse 1 or verse 12, and I want to say this so that we avoid any misunderstanding. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is, the first thing I want to say is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, always has moral and ethical implications. Uh, the implications, of the way, implications for the way we live our lives, okay? Uh, as followers of Jesus. Uh, the Bible's teaching uh, on how Christian people are to live in response to the gospel. That's what it's always about, right? So Christian living is always in response to the gospel. And so this is Christian ethics. This isn't Paul's instructions to the Roman world, how the Roman world should live. This is not Paul's instructions telling the secular how they should live. This is Paul's instructions to those who say they belong to Jesus, those who are loved and chosen by God. And so in this passage, what, what's happening is Paul is putting forward a Christian view of the body and sex. He's applying it to Christian people. He's calling Christian people uh, how to live. That's what he's doing, right? Paul isn't telling the outsider how to live. He's not imposing a Christian ethic on them because they don't share Christian beliefs, right? His concern for the outsider is always that the outsider might come to know Jesus, that's Paul's primary concern always. And the logic that follows is that if you come to know Jesus, you would follow his commands, you would follow his, his instructions, you would live under his rule. As, <clears throat> and so this is Paul's instructions to Christian people. And I do want us to understand that. Uh, and so if you are not a Christian, don't get offended. Because this is, Paul is not telling you to live this way. Okay? This is for Christian people. That's the first thing. Second thing I want to say is that there is a gospel logic to Christian living. Uh, there is a gospel logic to Christian morality or Christian ethics. And this is what, uh, as I always say, this is what sets Christianity apart from religion. And if you don't get the logic right, you go down the path of either despair or pride when it comes to the Christian life. Christian living is always a response to God's unconditional love. His choice in saving. That's chapter 1, verse 4. And so Christian living is always a response to what God has done to save. Remember in religion, this is how religion works. In religion, you live a certain way, you pursue a moral path, you keep the commandments to earn God's favor, to earn God's love, to earn God's forgiveness. Religion says, you must live this way to please God, right? To earn God's favor, okay? Christianity says, this is how you need to live because he has saved you. One says, make sure you're good enough to be saved. The other says, make sure you're living to please God because he has saved you. So there's a marked difference between the two, and often uh, it's Christmas, so I was thinking of Santa. Uh, that's the difference between Santa and the God of the Bible, if you think about it, right? Because 
Santa only gifts those who are on the <coughs> good list, those who please him. And what happens if you're on his naughty list? If you displease him, you're out. So you do to earn God's favor. Well, the God of the Bible isn't like that. The God of the Bible comes and he gifts you at your worst, right? He favors those on the naughty list. And so what happens is you now do good not to earn his favor. You do good because you are thankful. It's a grateful response to his love, to his gift, to salvation. The moment you think that good works in the Christian life is the means to earning God's favor, you are moving outside the Bible and you're moving outside Christianity. And so that's my second preface, right? And it's either going to lead you down the path of despair or pride. Despair because you feel you're never good enough when you try to be good because you can't live up to God's desires. Or pride that will lead you looking down on other people because you think you are good enough, okay? Okay. The logic of the gospel works very differently because it says doing good isn't about earning God's favor. God has already shown you favor in the Lord Jesus. The Christian way of life is always the way of gratefulness. The Christian way of life is always living to please God because He has first loved us. It's a life of gratefulness, okay? So those are the two prefaces that it's important for us to get right. I put them down, so you need to keep them in the back of your mind always, okay? So, have a look at verse 1 to verse 12. Paul is reminding the Christian community how to live, and he highlights two areas, holy living in the area of sexual morality and holy living in loving one another. Okay, so those are the two things, okay, we're going to look at. Now, uh, in your Bibles, if you look at me at verse 1 to verse 2, you see that Paul's instructions is anew. This is not a new thing that he's saying to the Thessalonian church, uh, live pleasing God more and more. Now you see there in verse 1, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instruct you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. So, as I said, you know, this is a church community Paul really gives thanks for because, because of the way they are. They're marked with faith, love, and hope. And he says, you know, we know that you're already living to please God. And then notice he says, now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. See there? Now come down to verse 10. He says the same thing. I know you're living it out. Yet we urge you, notice, to do so more and more. <clears throat> now, that tells me two things, or it should tell us two things. Just because you're, you're doing something well doesn't mean you don't need to be encouraged to keep doing it. Because we all need encouragement, right? To, to keep doing it, to stay the course, to keep bearing the fruit of godliness and love in our lives. Paul actually celebrates when he sees God's people doing well. Paul celebrates when he sees God's people obey God's word. Uh, Paul celebrates when he sees uh, God's people live out God's commands in their lives in the world. Okay? So that's the first thing I want you to notice. But there is a second thing. He encourages them to do this, notice, more and more. You see in verse 1 and verse 10. And so here's the second thing. Notice that there is always a more and more when it comes to Christian living. More and more to living a life that pleases God. There is always more and more when it comes to growing the Christian life. We can always bear more fruit, right? I think of uh, Big Jason, I think of Matt Ha. There's always more gains, right? Sometimes for us, we all gain, just not on the right places. But there is always a more and more. And so here's the thing. The posture of, the Christian, of Christian maturity is never to think that we have arrived. But to remember, there's always a more and more. Okay, let me say that again. The posture of Christian maturity is to never think that we have arrived. But to remember, there's always more and more. <clears throat> right? And the example I always use, you know, when I do the premarital stuff with couples who get married here at Grace Point, I always say to them, the wedding day is not it. No one ever thinks, oh, you know, at the wedding day, we have arrived, we're done. There's nothing more. Oh, that's it. Nothing more to this relationship, no more to experience. No, the wedding is only the start of, the new sta of a new stage of life. There's more and more to come in this relationship. There's more and more to know and experience, to enjoy. So too, the Christian life, okay? And, and those of you who are into sport, you know this. There's always more to more, more and more when it comes to being better, being more skilled. There's always improvement, right? 
So listen very carefully. If you're a follower of Jesus, something is wrong if you're not growing. If you're not experiencing change, if you're not growing in your understanding, your knowledge of the Bible and the Word, if you're not growing in practical godliness and love, okay? Uh, that's why uh, you'll notice there in your outlines, I put a couple of passages down because there are so many passages in the sweep of the New Testament that encourage us to grow more and more. Growing in godliness, godliness and love, 2 Peter 1, right? Becoming more like Jesus, Colossians 1, 28. Growing in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. Excelling in the grace of generosity, 2 Corinthians 8. And, and so here's the thing, right? If there is, if there is, not, if there is not a, a posture of more and more, and if there is no fruit that's coming in your Christian life, it's unlikely that you're a Christian. Paul says there's always more and more when it comes to your Christian life, a more and more when it comes to living a life that pleases God. Now, this is the first area he looks at, verses 3 to verse 8. Have a look with me. Paul says, it's God's will, will for his people to be sanctified. It's God's will for his people to be set apart, and the idea of sanctified is set apart to be different. And that's what a church is, okay? Remember what I said, uh, the church is the called out people of God. God has called them out and gathered them to be a city within the city, a new society within society, a new culture within culture, a new community in the community. And so it shouldn't be surprised that Paul says, you know what? You are a sanctified people, set apart to be different because of who you belong to. You belong to Jesus. And so Paul says, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, God has set you apart to be different. And the one area he highlights is your sex life. Christian people are set apart to be different in their sex lives. And so uh, look at verse 3, 4, 6, and 7 with me. <clears throat> uh, very quickly, he says you should avoid sexual immorality. You should be self-controlled when it comes to your sexual desires. <clears throat> verse 6, you should not take sex, sexual advantage of your Christian brothers or sisters. And then he sums it up in verse 7. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life when it comes to sex. Now, the assumption here, and it's good for us to get the assumption right, the assumption here is that if you knew God, you would also know His design and purposes for what He creates. If so, if you know God and He created sex, you would know His design and purpose for sex. And if you didn't know God, well, you wouldn't know His design and purpose, so you would live anywhere you want anyway. Which is why, if you look very carefully at these verses, you notice two things. Notice in verse 5, Paul says pagans. Paul says the pagans. Can you see there? He's referring to the Roman world in which he lived, right? The non-Christian world, he says, doesn't know the God of the Bible. And so, if they don't know the God of the Bible, well, they don't know his design and purposes for sex. So, they live to satisfy their sexual desires. Okay? If there is no design or purpose to sex, then it shouldn't be surprised that you will live to satisfy your sexual desires. And so the logic that follows is, if there is a God who had a good design and purpose for sex, then self-control may not be a bad thing or repressive thing if it means better sex. Sex saved for marriage may not be a bad thing or repressive thing if it means better sex, but only if there was a God who had a good design and purpose for sex. Now, I do want to say to you that what Paul writes here was incredibly radical and countercultural in his day, especially in the Roman context. Uh, the modern reader today reads what Paul says and will actually say, this is such a repressive view of sex, so primitive, so outdated, so puritanical. Christian ethics on sex belongs to the dark ages. That's what some people have actually said, right? We know that from the media. Let me tell you why it was so radical in the Roman context and why it remains radical today. So five things that might surprise you. I'm going to do this in summary. This is a summary of basically an article. <clears throat> and so it might surprise you about how sex was regarded in the Roman world. So it's there in your outline. Number one, <clears throat> prostitution was much more common than what it is today. And it was a norm. It was normal for men, even if you were married, to visit prostitutes. It was a norm in Roman culture. That's number one. Number two, sex was considered one-sided. So it's not a two-sided thing. Uh, it was, was one-sided. Pleasure or sexual gratification was reserved for the men, for men. 
for the male, for husbands in, even in a relationship. And so the job of the wife in the Roman world was to produce children, uh, to, to pleasure her husband, uh, and to be faithful to her husband while allowing her husband's sexual needs to be met outside marriage. That was the Roman world. That was the norm. The third thing, same-sex intercourse was common, but it wasn't considered a homosexual relationship. Uh, one author of Sex in the Ro Roman World writes this, the Romans did not look at people in terms of sexuality. So they're different from us, right? They, they don't think like us, but in terms of sexual role. So they saw uh, sexual activity in terms of roles. And so this is what one author writes, so long as the, a man was only ever the perpetrator and never the penetrated, he was still considered strong and masculine. But in the eyes of the Roman, if a man was on the receiving end, he was adopting the role of the woman and was reviled as effeminate because the Roman world did not have a high view of women. Number four, sex was all about power. That's how it worked in the Roman world. Sex was generally framed within power dynamics in the Roman world. I'm going to explain that to you in a moment, uh, a bit further. But what actually happens is the Romans viewed the world in terms of power, the dominant and the submissive, okay? And if you were the dominant, then you had greater license to engage in sex outside of marriage with anyone who was lower, who held a lower place in society and culture. The slave is one example, okay? Number five, rape was actually punishable by death. But the crime of rape was only applied to a Roman citizen, and that a Roman citizen in good standing, high standing. And so if you were a slave, and 40% of the empire were slaves, if you were a slave, it was considered property damage because you're non-human. And so, you know, if you were raped as a slave, you, you know, the perpetrator had to make reparations, you would pay for property damage. But if you were raped by your owner, well, that's not a crime because they could do whatever they want to you, okay? So that's the world of the, of the New Testament. It's very important for us to understand that. Uh, in an interview with Tom Holland, who is not a Christian, I might add, he writes on the incredible way Christianity shaped the Western world. And one of the ways it shaped the Western world was in the area of sex, sexual ethics, uh, and how it affected uh, people's view of the dignity of men and women. This is what he says in an interview. Christianity is nowadays regarded as patriarchal and repressive, <clears throat> but it is radically egalitarian in the context of the world in which it was born. Okay? In Latin, the word for ejaculate and urinate is the same for men. That implies that for the Roman, the mouth, the vagina, the anus of an inferior is like a urinal. Right? It's something that you void your fluids and then you move on. That's the Roman world. Against this, Tom Holland writes, Paul is teaching, saying, no, a woman's body, a boy's body, a girl's body, a man's body has to be regarded as sacred, held and upheld with dignity. And the way in which sexual relations have to be regulated is it has to be modeled on the relationship of Christ and His church. That, he says, gives women an incredible dignity. Now, that's coming from a non-Christian, by the way, as he surveys and un the landscape of the Roman world. Uh, Justin Toe, some of you have heard uh, her speak. She speaks from the Center of Public Christianity in our city. Uh, and she wrote a piece during the Me Too movement. Many of you are familiar with the Me Too movement. And she too writes, <coughs> uh, <coughs> quoting Tom Holland on sex in the Roman world. And she writes, you know, if you read uh, Tom Holland's work, uh, Dominion is one of them, he writes, in the ancient world, he writes, the penis was typically described in violent terms. It stabs, it eviscerates, it's a sword, it's a dagger, it's a spear, it jabs. And then, this is the question that's raised. Who wants to be on the receiving end of that? <clears throat> but if you were a slave in a Roman household, Holland says, you could be under constant attack and no one would interfere. Your master has the absolute right to rape you when and how he likes, any way that he wants, any orifice. It doesn't matter what sex you are. It doesn't matter what age you are. He can do what he likes. Now, there is a clarification. Not all masters are predatory, but power dynamics. And so here we're coming back to that. Power dynamics saturated the Roman world. And that accorded with the bigger picture of the classical world. 
Because consider the gods of the Roman world. Zeus, Apollos, Dionysius, Holland writes in his book, Dominion, the history of the Western world, they are all habitual rapists. And yet, Tom Holland says, the Apostle Paul who wrote huge slabs of the New Testament and is today seen as an incurable scold emerges as an unlikely advocate for women. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul encourages husbands to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So what's actually happening is when you see Christian ethics in the New Testament, what's actually happening, it's so radical because Paul links the wife with the church and the husband with Jesus. Paul provided an alternative model of male power, one focus on love and service, not force and domination, one focus on self-giving love and not self-gratification, okay? And so Christianity gave incredible dignity to marriage, uh, to wives, to women, to the male and female slaves by its radical sexual ethics, because it said, if you are a Christian, you must avoid sexual immorality, be faithful to your wife, Love and serve her the way Jesus laid down his life for her. It said, if you're a Christian, you must exercise self-control over your sexual desires because sex is not about sexual self-gratification, but self-giving love in the service of the other in marriage. Like Jesus, who laid down his life for his bride, the church, he was committed to her. It said, if you're a Christian, you must not take sexual advantage of those you have power over. Men and women are not objects, property to be used for your self-gratification. Power is used, like Jesus, in the service of the weak, the vulnerable, to serve them, to elevate them. The Bible has always been way ahead of the Me Too movement. You know that? Way ahead. Because this is the radical, progressive nature of Christian sexual ethics that says the powerful should not prey on the weak. Husbands should be faithful and serve their wives. Men should not objectify women or sexually abuse them. Women are not objects to be used and discarded for men's sexual gratification. Now, let me say that this is not Paul's instructions to the Roman world. It's not even Paul's instructions to our secular world, okay? This is Paul's instructions to Christian people. Important to remember that. <coughs> because he says, if you're a Christian... You're called to be set apart to be different when it comes to your sex life. And so verse 3, you should avoid sexual immorality. The idea there is to cut off, right? It's not contemplate, not wait, cut off. And, and the contrast there is, you know, like Joseph, <coughs> when he was sexually tempted by Potiphar's wife, Genesis 39, we, re we read, he ran, he fled. He didn't entertain it. Contrast that with David in 2 Samuel 11, who, when he saw Bathsheba bathing, he lingered, and he gave in to his sexual desires. In fact, what did he actually do? He used his power as king to take her, and then he discarded her like a piece of meat, okay? Verse 4, you should be self-controlled when it comes to your sexual desires. Unlike the Roman world and much of the secular world, right, sex is for self-gratification, it's about fulfilling my desires. Sex is transactional between two people wanting to just get it on. But the Bible teaches that sex is God's gift to be enjoyed in a self-giving relationship of lasting life commitment. Which is why uh, the author and historian John Dixon, uh, in one of his books, he raises this question, right? He says, think with me for a moment, he says, is sex more like a a Datsun, or is it like a Porsche? Is it, is it to be valued like a Datsun or a Porsche? Okay, now if you don't know what a Datsun is, don't worry. Okay, maybe think of a 20-year-old car. And so he says, my first car was an orange Datsun. It got me from A to B, but it was a rust bucket. <laughs> Cost me a few thousand dollars, so I never treated it too well. No problems lending it out to friends. I figured if they crashed it, it was no big deal. Suppose though, he said, I own a Porsche 968. I can assure you, I didn't, I'd care for it with my life. I certainly wouldn't lend it out. In my mind, a valuable machine deserves the most utmost care. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I want to say to you that the media 
social influencers, Netflix, every rom-com you see, every online editorial expert has fooled us into believing the Datsun view of sex in society and culture. Two people getting it on, lend it out. It's not that special. But you know, the Bible has a much higher elevated view of sex. In fact, the Bible views sex more than the secular world, right? The Bible actually says it's valuable. It needs to be looked after. It's not a biolog just a biological exchange where we gratify our urges. If we are nothing more than glorified apes who wear Adidas or Nike, like LLM, <laughs> then, yeah, live by your sexual desires. But if there was a creator who loved you and designed you and made you and people around you in his image as men and women who design a purpose for sex, then it makes sense to protect it, to value it, to save it for a committed relationship. Can you see why Paul says, be controlled when it comes to your sexual desires? It's not because God is being repressive. It's not because God is ashamed of sex. It's because the creator wants you to enjoy the best sex as he's designed it. And so verse 6 comes as no surprise. You should not take sexual advantage of your Christian brothers or sisters. Okay? And then verse 7 sums it up. Live a holy life when it comes to sex, not just in the world, but in the church. Okay? And so the Bible's call to holiness is a call to be holy sexually in the world, but also in the church, in the way we relate as brothers and sisters. But I do want to say this only applies to Christians, right? Because this is Paul's call to the Christian man or woman. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, second area, have a look at the second area, verse 9 and verse 12. <coughs> it's no surprise because this is the nature of the gospel, right? Verse 9, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. If God's great act of love is sacrificially and unconditionally laying down his life for you, it should be no surprise that you would sacrificially and unconditionally lay down your life for the people around you. You will love them the way God has loved you. Uh, that's why John 13, verse 35, we read, By this everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. How do you know someone's a Christian? How do you know they are a Christian? Well, if they've experienced the love of God, then they will actually express the love of God for the body of Christ. Right? They're brothers and sisters. It is what I call one of the necessary fruits of the gospel in the Christian life. Love for others in your church family. It is a necessary fruit. It's the evidence, it's the proof that you have been converted, that you know the Spirit of God is alive and at work in you. And it's a consistent theme in the New Testament. I mean, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, uh, the Apostle John writes, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Then he says, you know, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God actually lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. So it's no point saying, I know God, I love God, I've experienced Him. Well, that can't be true if you don't love the body of Christ, okay? Which is why there's no such thing as a churchless Christian. There is no such thing as a churchless Christian. Don't get me wrong, you don't need to commit to a church community to be a Christian. Salvation is never based in your works. It's purely based on your trust in the Lord Jesus. But a Christian would commit themselves to church community. A Christian would commit themselves to a life of love and sacrifice to the body of Christ. It is a necessary fruit of Christian conversion. Now, the great thing about the Thessalonian church is when you read verse 9, it makes it clear they were already doing this. Okay? And yet Paul calls them to do this more and more because it pleased God. It was a mark of maturity. So you need to listen very carefully because at its most basic level, a life that pleases God is a life we are growing to love and serve your church family more and more. Okay? Do you hear that? At its most basic, a life that pleases God is a life where you're growing to love and search, serve your church family more and more. Now, over the years, I meet many people uh, here at Grace Point, people wanting to do ministry who sometimes come to our church, really ambitious to serve the gospel. I want to reach unreached people groups. I want to do ministry reaching marginalized people. Uh, I want to start something at Grace Point that will impact our city. I want to go into full-time Christian ministry. People even say, I want to do big things for God through the church. I've got a vision. And I've often said in response, what is the point of wanting to reach people overseas 
when you cannot even love and serve your church family here? What's the point of having a big vision for the community, a big vision for the suburb, when you can't even do the basic, love and serve your church family here? You know, the life and mission of the church actually starts when you are loving and serving your church family. That's John 13, verse 35. By this you will know. They will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's the life of witness. Mission actually starts when you love the people of God around you. Mission actually starts when you serve the people of God around you the way Christ has served you. In fact, the growing depth of your experience of the love of God is directly proportional to your love for your church family. Well, it should be. Maturity in the Christian life is directly proportional to love for your church family. And I think that comes as a shock for most people because most of us only think of our relationship to God in individual you know, terms. Me, myself, and I, my relationship with God. Well, if you had a relationship with God and you had a growing relationship with God, well, you would grow in your love and service to the people around you. Uh, because Paul says, a growing experience of God's love leads to a growing love for others in your church family. Okay? Now, how is that expressed? Well, verse 11 and 12 actually does it. So have a look with me. He says, this is how you love each other. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone else. So the first thing he says, don't be a person of controversy. Right? That's what he means by living a quiet life. He's not saying, you know, don't be an extrovert like Alan Lamb. Don't be the life of the party like Alan Lamb. That's not what he's saying, okay? He's saying, don't be a person of controversy, right? Don't be a person who stirs up trouble in the church, pushing always to have your way. Okay, that's the first thing he says. The second thing he says is, don't be a busybody. Mind your own business, If you look at chapter 5, verse 14, and we will get to it, you begin to discover that there were some people in the Thessalonian church who were idle, and then they were interfering in other people's life. Now, I'll be honest with you, you know, if you scan uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, this is probably the only problem you're going to find in this church. Everything's great about this church, and this is the only problem you find, right? Because later in 2 Thessalonians, the second letter he writes, chapter 3, he has to address the same problem. And so, chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, he writes, We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busybodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. So, in other words, instead of working, they're meddling in other people's lives. And so, the closest way I can describe this is, this is the person who has nothing to do, so they feel the need to interfere in other people's lives in the church because they think they know better, okay? Many of you, some of you have experienced that. Paul says, hey, mind your own business, work with your hands as we told you. Busy yourself, be productive. In fact, Paul says, give yourself to working so that you aren't a sponge on others. Don't be a drain on others, right? So verse 12, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Now, where has Paul Where has Paul said that before? Well, he has said that before, hasn't he? Because he did it in chapter 2. He spoke of his own life and the way he related to the Thessalonian church. Because isn't this how Paul has loved the Thessalonians? Isn't this how he shared his life with them? We read in chapter 2, like a nursing mother, he shared his life with them in toil and hardship so that he wouldn't be a sponge in their lives, so that he wouldn't burden them. And why did he work with his hands? so that he could actually continue bringing the good news of Jesus to them, so that he, so they could continue experiencing the goodness of the gospel in their lives. And what Paul says is incredibly radical because work for him was the way Christian people express love for each other. I think that's radical because most of us think of work only in terms of benefiting ourselves. Paul thinks of his work and our work as a way of benefiting others in a church community. I think that's incredibly radical. He says, work with your hands. That's also radical. Why? Because very quickly in the Roman world, right, working with your hands um, was considered undignified. It was undignified work, right? The goal in the Roman world is to not work, by the way, right? The life of leisure, okay? But notice what Paul says, love each other by working with your hands so that you aren't a drain on others, and so you can provide for others the way he's provided for them from chapter 2. And 
I think what's incredible is that Paul actually in this verse is actually affirming even the lowest, most menial work when it's done in love for others. Notice the worth of your work isn't found in your profession, but how it serves and benefits others. Which is why whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or a trader or laborer, your worth and value isn't in your profession, but the extent to which it is serving others. Not being a drain on others, and ensuring that others actually experience the goodness of the gospel like Paul in chapter 2. I think this is so countercultural to the world's approach to work. Because the way the, world's, the world works, like the Roman world, some work is more worthy than others. Some work is beneath me, or the elitist approach to work. I only work if I'm paid to do what I think I'm worth, right? Uh, only work that affirms my value is worth doing. But the work in the Bible is different. The Bible says all work is an expression of your love for others. Not being a drain to them, but also providing so that they can actually experience the goodness of the gospel. Work is an expression of self-giving love that you've experienced in the gospel. I think that's pretty radical. And so Paul says, grow in your love for each other in a church community by leading a quiet life. Don't be a person of controversy. Right? Don't be a pushy person. By not being a busybody, interfering in people's lives because you think you know better. And by working so you aren't on a drain, drain on others, so you aren't a drain on others, and by working so that others are provided for, so that they experience the goodness of the gospel, so your resources go towards supporting others. Now, I think this passage is a real challenge, okay? <clears throat> I do think it's a challenge. Challenge to sexual holiness, challenge to love in a community. So I'm going to say three things as I bring this to a close, okay? Here's number one. Maybe as you've heard me speak about sexual holiness within the church, maybe you're filled with guilt because of your past, your failure, or maybe you are angry because you've been taken advantage of. Can I say that if you are filled with guilt, the gospel is good news because it says forgiveness is possible. A fresh start is possible. Your feelings of guilt will always come. And it's a good thing because it should drive you to the good news of Jesus. The gospel will never say to you, make up for your past sexual sins to be accepted. Fix up your sex life before coming to Jesus. The gospel says, repent. Trust the work of the Savior who has died for your every sin, even your sexual sins. And so today, hear his words of assurance that you heard. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not just for ours, not just for yours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Come and be forgiven. Come and be forgiven. Can I say to you that if you are filled with anger because you've been taken advantage of sexually, you are right to be angry. It should never have happened. Can I say to you, God understands. He understands your pain and your anger. And His invitation to you is to bring it to Him. Jesus knows and understands your pain and suffering because He too suffered unjustly. He too was treated unfairly in the worst possible way. He was beaten, he was humiliated, he was stripped, he was degraded, and he was shamed at the cross. And he remains for you, and he remains with you. Come, let him share your pain. Come, let him heal you. That's the first thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say. Maybe as you've heard me speak about sexual holiness, you've come to realize this is something you need help with to pursue and to work on. Can I say to you that we need to work on it together? Okay? Remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Joe spoke on purity in a sexually charged world? That's the reality of the world we live in. You cannot escape the sexualized world you live in, right? Neither could Christians in the Roman world. And sometimes we're embarrassed and we're ashamed to talk about our sexual struggles. The Bible is not ashamed to talk about it, which is why Paul writes to the churches about it. 
one could actually say the world of the New Testament was probably even more sexualized than our secular world. He expected the church to struggle with sexual holiness. That's why he writes to the church. And he expects the church community to work to please God in sexual holiness. And so maybe as you've heard me speak about sexual holiness, you come to realize this is something you're struggling with, you need help to work in this area. Speak to your leaders. Speak to a leader here at Grace Point you trust. Speak to a Christian brother or sister you trust. Speak to me. Speak to one of the elders here. Sometimes we forget that the life of holiness, the life of holiness is a community effort. It's a shared effort. That's two. Three. Maybe as you've come to heard me speak about love for each other, you've realized, you know, that's the missing fruit in my Christian life. The necessary fruit that I need to bear. Because in the Christian life, it is impossible that you could know more and experience of God and not grow more to love your church family. It's impossible. That's why Paul says to the Thessalonian church about your love for each other, right? I don't have to write because God has taught you how to love, but I want you to grow in your love more and more for each other. Every so often I get asked this question, right? Leaders in the church will ask me this question. Do you think so-and-so is a Christian? And it's not a bad question to ask. Do you think so-and-so is a Christian? And they ask that because there's so little fruit in their lives. The fruit of generosity is not present. The fruit of love for church is not present. The fruit of sacrificial service is not present. And as a pastor, I always think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 7. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them. Now, maybe there is some fruit, because we are always trying to be gracious. A little here, off and on. So, here's the thing. When I am asked a question like that, I often say, I can't say they aren't Christian. I can't say they aren't Christian. If they profess to be Christian, and there's nothing ungodly in their lives, but there's no fruit. But then I also say, but I can't say they aren't Christian but it's unlikely they are as well. So I don't know. But I do know and I can know when I see the fruit of love in someone for their church family, when I see a pattern of service and self-sacrificial love for others in the church community. That's when I do know someone is a follower of Jesus because they're not just talking about following Jesus, they are bearing the fruit of love as followers of Jesus. It shows they've experienced the gospel. Let me ask you this question. Do you love the people here? Do you resent them? Is serving them burdensome to you? Paul says, a life that pleases God is a life that's growing in love for each other. Are we doing that more and more? Worth asking, isn't it? I'm going to pray for us. The music team are going to come up and lead us in helping us respond. Gracious God, We just want to recognize this morning we're broken and fallen in so many different ways. Your word comes to us not as a word to crush us. Your word is not there to crush us, crush us because we feel guilt sexually, not to crush us because uh, we are angry and we've been reminded of unfairness and sexual sin others have committed in our lives. Your word is not here to guilt us because we don't love the way we should. Your word is here to drive us to the cross. Your word comes as a merciful, loving, gracious word that's driving us to the cross so that for those who are sexually broken, there is forgiveness. For those who are angry, there is healing. And for those who are struggling to love, there is actually empowerment to know your love so that we might be moved to love our church family more and more. Our Father and our God, help us to be a church community that is moved by the power of your spirit and by the enabling of your gospel to live lives that please you in these two areas. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.